Lori Love sits in front of three monitors in a bedroom in Suffolk, England. The glow of the screens lights his face in the dark. Terminal windows fill with green text scrolling faster than most people can read. He's just breached the United States Army's network. Not because he's a genius, because they left critical systems poorly secured. That single breach sets off a chain reaction that will make him one of the most wanted hackers in the world. He'll breach the Federal Reserve, the FBI, NASA, and when they come for him, he'll do something no hacker has ever done before. He'll win. Default passwords, unpatched systems, open ports that haven't been secured since 2009. He expects the American military to be competent. Instead, he's looking at infrastructure that wouldn't survive a basic penetration test. But he's not here to steal secrets. He's here to send a message. He creates a text file, one sentence. He buries it deep in their file system where it will sit unnoticed for months. Tell your government to stop killing innocent people. Then he moves to the next target, the Federal Reserve, the Missile Defense Agency, NASA, the Environmental Protection Agency. One by one, he walks through their networks undetected. His name is Lori Love. He's 28 years old, and he's about to start a war he can't win. This story is presented for educational purposes only. All sources are linked in the description. The operation doesn't start with Lori Love. It starts with Aaron Swartz. January 11th, 2013, Brooklyn, New York. Aaron Swartz hangs himself in his apartment. He's 26 years old, a programmer, an activist, a kid who believes information should be free. The US government is prosecuting him for downloading academic journals from MIT. They want 35 years in prison. He chooses death instead. Within 48 hours, Anonymous declares Operation Last Resort. The hacker collective promises retaliation against the Justice Department. But Anonymous is chaotic, disorganized. Their attacks are symbolic. Website defacements, DDoS floods, press releases. But one hacker has a different plan, something no one has tried before something that will embarrass the U.S. government. Lori doesn't know Aaron personally, but he knows the formula. Brilliant mind plus overreaching prosecution equals destroyed life. And he knows that if the U.S. government can crush Aaron Swartz for downloading PDFs, they can crush anyone. So Lori decides to hack back, not as revenge, as a warning. October 2012, Stratishall, Suffolk, a small village in the English countryside. Laurie sits at his desk, surrounded by computer equipment and empty coffee mugs. He isn't elite. He's observant. He's self-taught, competent, methodical. He runs basic reconnaissance scans against U.S. government networks. He's looking for vulnerabilities. What he finds is worse. He finds negligence. The U.S. Army is running SQL servers with default credentials, the kind of mistake a college student would catch. Lori writes a simple script. It works on the first try. He's inside. The network is a maze of unencrypted databases, personnel records, contractor information. He could steal everything. Instead, he plants his flag, a text file criticizing U.S. foreign policy, and moves on. Next target, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Lower Manhattan, the building that holds America's gold reserves. The Fed's network is supposed to be impenetrable. It's not. Lori finds an unpatched vulnerability in their web framework, the same class of flaw that will later devastate major corporations. He writes an exploit, gets root access, downloads employee databases. He doesn't sell the data, he doesn't publish it. He keeps it as proof, evidence that the institutions claiming to protect America can't even protect themselves. Then he hits the Missile Defense Agency, then NASA, then the Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory in New Jersey, the same FBI facility that investigates cybercrime. The irony isn't lost on him. He's hacking the hackers. But his most audacious hack is still coming, and it involves turning a government website into a video game. January 2013, Washington, D.C. The U.S. Sentencing Commission. Anonymous has just defaced the USSC website, the agency that sets federal sentencing guidelines. But the defacement is generic, a manifesto, a threat. Standard hacktivist theater. The compromised site is transformed into something different, 
something nobody expects. The entire website is rebuilt as a playable Asteroids game. The game loads in browsers worldwide. Players control a small spaceship. The Asteroids aren't rocks. They're the names of federal prosecutors, the ones who prosecuted Aaron Swartz, the ones who drove him to suicide. Visitors to the U.S. Sentencing Commission website can now shoot down prosecutors in a browser-based arcade game. The FBI is furious. The media is baffled. How do you respond to a hacker who turns your website into a political statement disguised as a 1980s video game? The game stays live for hours before the servers are taken offline completely. It's brilliant. It's absurd. It's exactly the kind of thing that makes the government appear vulnerable. Investigators later link elements of the intrusion to Lori Love, and it puts a massive target on his back. May 2013, dawn breaks over Stratishall. Three black SUVs roll down the quiet country road and stop outside Lori's house. UK police exit the vehicles, warrant in hand, acting on evidence provided by the FBI. They knock. Lori's father opens the door. Inside, they seize his computers, his hard drives, his phones, his USB sticks. They're polite, but thorough. One officer asks if there are weapons in the house. Lori watches them bag his equipment piece by piece, his entire digital life packed into evidence boxes. His father demands answers. They won't give any. They say it's just an investigation. They say he'll hear from them. He doesn't hear from them for six months. During those six months, Lori starts having seizures. The doctors can't explain why. He's never had them before, but now, twice a week, his brain misfires. He loses consciousness, wakes up on the floor with blood in his mouth. His parents find him convulsing in his bedroom, in the kitchen, once in the garden. October 2013. Newark, New Jersey, a federal courthouse. A grand jury indicts him on multiple counts. Unauthorized access to protected computers, conspiracy, computer fraud. The evidence is overwhelming. Server logs, IP addresses, digital forensics traced back to his systems. Maximum sentence, 99 years. The prosecutor calls him one of the most sophisticated hackers we've ever seen. Back in Suffolk, Lori reads the indictment in his bedroom the same room where he commits every crime they're describing. He doesn't try to hide, that's never the point. He wants them to know they've been breached. He wants them to feel exposed. But now, the consequences are real. The US government wants him extradited. They want him in an American prison for the rest of his life. But Lori has a weapon they don't expect, British law, and he's about to use it in a way no hacker has before. 2014, Suffolk Police Headquarters. British police have Lori's computers in their forensics lab, but there's a problem. Everything is encrypted. His hard drives are locked behind strong encryption, effectively inaccessible without the password. Technicians stare at screens full of random data, useless without the keys. The police invoke RIPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, a British law that allows them to demand encryption keys. If Lori refuses to hand over his passwords, he can be jailed for up to five years, just for silence. They give him a deadline. Provide the passwords or face immediate imprisonment. Lori refuses. His lawyers argue that forcing him to decrypt his own devices violates his right against self-incrimination. The police argue that encryption shouldn't shield criminals from justice. The standoff drags on for months. The police threaten prosecution. Lori doesn't budge. At this point, the case stops being about hacking at all. It becomes about whether the government can force you to unlock your own mind. And if they can't break the encryption, they can't prove most of their case. Eventually, the British authorities back down. They never charge him under RIPA. The encrypted drives remain locked in an evidence room, unreadable. The data they contain will never be recovered. It's a small victory, but it shows something crucial. Lori knows how to fight and he's going to need that skill, because the Americans aren't giving up. 2014, London, the Home Office. The United States formally requests the UK surrender Laurie Love. His father, Alexander Love, a prison chaplain, empties his savings to hire lawyers. The legal team is blunt. If you go to America, you'll never leave. Here's what the US wants. They want to make an example. After Aaron Swartz's suicide, there's public backlash. People say the Justice Department is too aggressive, that they destroyed a young man over a victimless crime. Now they have another target, another hacker, 
another activist. And this time, they're not backing down. Lori's legal team builds a defense around medical evidence. He has Asperger's syndrome, severe eczema that covers his arms and torso, a seizure disorder that develops around the time of the investigation. The argument, extraditing him to U.S. custody would violate his human rights. American prisons don't accommodate disability. If you're autistic, if you have mental health conditions, you get placed in administrative segregation, solitary confinement, 23 hours a day in a system widely criticized for causing severe psychological harm. The UK has already seen this before. Gary McKinnon, another autistic hacker, fights extradition for 10 years. The Home Secretary eventually blocks it, citing human rights concerns. Lori's lawyers argue he deserves the same protection. The Crown Prosecution Service argues the opposite. American prisons are humane. He'll receive adequate medical care. The US government makes assurances. Lori knows those assurances are worthless. September 2016. Westminster Magistrates Court, London. The wood-paneled courtroom fills with lawyers, journalists, supporters. The extradition hearing begins. The American prosecutor presents forensic evidence, server logs, encrypted chat transcripts, the scripts Lori uses. The technical trail is undeniable. Lori's lawyer presents medical reports, psychiatric evaluations, expert testimony explaining that solitary confinement would likely cause severe deterioration in his condition. The judge listens, takes notes, says she'll issue a ruling later. Two months later, November 2016, the judge rules against him. Extradition approved. It looks like Lori Love is going to America, but he has one final move left. 2017 to 2018, the final battle. The appeal drags on for 18 months. During that time, Lori's seizures worsen. He's having them three, four times a week. The medication makes him foggy. He can't code anymore, can barely read. His father watches his son deteriorate. But Alexander Love refuses to give up. He becomes Lori's public advocate. He contacts MPs. He gives interviews to the BBC, The Guardian, tech publications. He builds a campaign. Don't extradite Lori Love. Father and son appear together at press conferences. Alexander speaking when Lori can't find the words. The hacker community mobilizes. Security researchers sign petitions. Even some American lawyers argue that prosecuting Lori serves no justice. It's just revenge. But the extradition machinery grinds forward. February 18th, 2018. The Royal Courts of Justice. London, the imposing Gothic building on the Strand. Two judges hear Laurie's final appeal. His legal team presents updated psychiatric reports, statistics on autistic inmates in U.S. custody, testimony from prison reform advocates. The American lawyers are polished and prepared. They argue that Laurie is a criminal who deserves punishment, that his autism doesn't exempt him from consequences. Laurie's lawyer counters, sending Mr. Love to America is sending him to conditions that would destroy him. The evidence is overwhelming. The judges deliberate for two weeks. Five years of legal warfare come down to a single ruling. February 5th, 2018. London. The ruling. The High Court rules in Lori's favor. Extradition blocked. The judgment is 28 pages long. The key line? We are satisfied that Mr. Love's extradition would be oppressive by reason of his physical and mental condition. The American prosecutors appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refuses to hear it. The extradition fight is over. Lori Love has done something almost no hacker has ever done. He beat the United States government in court. Outside the courthouse, Lori stands with his father. Cameras flash. Reporters shout questions. Alexander wraps his arm around his son's shoulders. For the first time in five years, they can breathe. But the charges remain. If Lori ever sets foot on American soil, an airport, a layover, a connecting flight, he'll be arrested immediately. He can never visit the US, can never transit through American territory. He's effectively banned from the country he hacks. The British Crown Prosecution Service considers domestic charges. The UK had the legal authority to prosecute him themselves and chose not to. After six months, they quietly dropped the case, not in the public interest to prosecute. Laurie is free, sort of. Today, Laurie Love sits in front of three monitors again, but he's not breaking into networks anymore. He's writing articles about digital rights, legal briefs for hackers facing extradition. He works in cybersecurity research. He gives talks about the justice system. He advocates for others in his position. 
He never apologizes for the hacks, never says he regrets them, because the systems he breaches, they're still vulnerable. The agencies he humiliates, they're still running unpatched infrastructure. The only difference now is that they know someone's watching. Lori doesn't set out to become a legal precedent. He sets out to prove a point, that the US government's cybersecurity is inadequate and their justice system targets the vulnerable. He proves both. The Lori Love case is now cited in extradition hearings across Europe. It's a shield for hackers with disabilities, a wall between activists and overreaching prosecution. When they come for him, he fights back with the one weapon they can't hack, the law. The servers he compromises have been patched, the database is secured, but the message remains. You can hack the hacker, but you can't hack human rights. Aaron Swartz didn't survive the weight of federal prosecution. Lori Love does. And in surviving, he builds the precedent that might save the next hacker who faces the same impossible choice. If you want to learn more about hacker extradition cases or the technical details of Lori's intrusions, all sources and court documents are linked in the description. What do you think? Was Lori Love a criminal or an activist? Let me know in the comments below.